If Jesus Christ himself came back, what an idiot he is. Oh, nothing new there. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You're gonna find people who just hate you because that's the world we live in. Persuasion is a weapon. It can be used for good or ill. Same way you have an M16 with a mom on the Ponderosa. Four men break out of jail and come in to rape her and her children and she blows them away. Bravo, good use of an M16. Grant Cardone is awful, he sucks. Lost his mind. Watching uh, Pornhub all day long. Scum sucking pigs, so go fuck yourself. I'm in that top 1%, I just am. That's why I'm the best. Now the liberals are just fucking crazy. They just throw labels. There's no more logical arguments left for liberals. What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Scuba dived on quaaludes at 80 feet. Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and this one is huge. A deep dive interview with the wolf of Wall Street himself. Jordan Belfort, but like you've never seen him, I believe in any other interview. Now I will warn you, about halfway through he goes absolutely wild on Grant Cardone. There's a big internet spat with them at the moment, some weirdness going on and he unleashes on that. There's some anger I think you'll find. I think the story that he tells about how Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt had a bidding war for his film and I just think you'll find this a bit different to the usual interviews you see with Jordan like you've never seen him before. So make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel because there's a lot more deep dive interviews with really interesting guests like this. Let's now get straight into the interview with the one and only Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Hi, it's Rob Moore here and welcome to the Live Disruptive Entrepreneur Podcast live stream. I think this man doesn't need an introduction, but I'm gonna give him one anyway. Uh, Jordan Belfort, thank you very much for doing this interview. No problem, no problem, happy to do it. Um, so I did a poll in my communities asking if people thought, my community thought that um, we should have you on the show. Out of about 505 votes, 497 were yes. So that's pretty much the biggest um, landslide victory we've ever had in our polls. So that's a good start. Well, I, I like I, I, the eight that said no. I love that because you got to have some people hating you in this world or else what's the point of living, right? <laughs> what, why? Why do you have to have some people that hate you? Because in this world, you have the haters drive engagement because like without the haters, like, it's really it's really sad, but it's true that the, that the way things work with virality in the internet is that when people start writing negative stuff, it creates controversy and more eyeballs. So I always say to my haters, just keep on hating because you know you drive so much engagement because it creates controversy and the internet loves controversy. There you go. Does, do any of them never get to you? Can you honestly say that you never are affected by what people say or write? Uh, not anymore. I, and early on, yes. And that's, that's a... Uh, you know, my own fault for allowing anybody to ever get under my skin. But I, I guess, you know, nowadays, if, if Jesus Christ himself came back and gave that, you know, sermon on the Temple Mount, you'd be seeing half people saying, what an idiot he is. Oh, nothing new there. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You could be the most amazing speaker with the greatest message. You're going to find people who just hate you because that's the world we live in. So... I most of all feel sorry for the people that, that are like that because, you know, I wonder what's going on in their life. They have to be, you know, so negative because, you know, I know my message is pure. It's great. And, um, you know, I understand there's, you know, some people deserve to be hated on, but I don't really see anything that is, is that like, you know, it's purely evil like that. You can disagree with me. Uh, and I like that. I, I, I love, you know, I love, I love the people who disagree with me in a very intelligent way. And that I really respect. And because there's always different opinions and different sides to any topic. Um, so I love that honest, healthy, logical debate. What I think is ridiculous is the emotional, you're an asshole, you're an that, that to me is worthless. Yeah. And what changed? You said it used to bother you before, it used to affect you, and you blame yourself, and now it doesn't. What changed? Well, you see, I certainly early on because I, you know, I think that that, um, you know, as confident as any person is, I think it takes you a little bit of time to realize, um, you know, what social media is really all about and, and, and how um, it allows people who are basically just cowards to feel like big shots and remain as cowards. And I, and I think I, I, I didn't really quite internalize that. And I actually maybe almost believe, like, not, not believe, just say I actually gave 
credence to like, oh, wow, they're saying things about me. That was many, I would say maybe like um, six or seven years ago, it really shifted for me. And I guess I did make mistakes. I'm the first person to admit that. And I think I still had some own limiting beliefs left over and some, you know, feelings of that, like, you know, what I did. And I probably said, what the fuck am I even talking about? It's just ridiculous. I do so much great stuff around the world. I've helped so many people. And once I made that shift, I just started feeling really sorry for these people more than anything. That's really what it came down to. And I also appreciate it because they drive massive engagement. So it became a funny thing where I love like those vicious comments of the day. I was with those vicious comments of the day. And it's just classic. It's hysterical. And you said limiting beliefs just there. You know, you had some limiting beliefs before. What were they? No, what I'm, beliefs about like, about like that, you know, listen, everybody makes mistakes. Everyone does great things. You know, the mistakes, I made some mistakes when I was um, very young, you know, in my early 20s when I, I got in trouble, I went to jail, people lost money. And listen, they were rich people. No, no, zero poor people lost money. When I was, that's not what it was about. So no one got wiped out, but still it's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. And the fact that everyone else was doing it on Wall Street still doesn't make it right. So like, I don't look back and say, oh, well, yeah, but everyone was losing people money. Okay, fair enough. But still not a good thing. So I, I had that, you know, in always in the back of my head. And I guess that when I would, you know, process what people said about me, um, that would creep up. And then finally, I got to a point saying, this is ridiculous. If, if, any, if there's a heaven, I'm going there because I do great stuff far outweighs anything negative I've done in my life. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very good about my prospects of entering the pearly gates. <laughs> Great. So obviously you're very famously known as the wolf of Wall Street. Um, what does the wolf mean? And do you think it's a positive or a negative thing to be known as the wolf of Wall Street? Good question. So it, I think that I probably have more negative anchors to that than other people. Like, for example... Um, when I was um, doing a, a deal where I was, you know, rolling out this this social network I have for salespeople around the world, and my staff all wanted to call it the Wolf Pack, and I was like, I don't know about that. There's some, like there's something about that that kind of struck me is maybe there's a lack of integrity or ethics attached, and they're all looking at me. They're like, what? Like, what are you talking about, guy? Like, no one else but me saw it. So I think. For me, I probably judge myself more harshly than anybody else does. And I, because I, I still relate back the Wolf of Wall Street to a life that included some amazing things, which was empowering young people to become expert closers, getting rich, um, you know, and really just you know living this amazing life. But there's also negative things attached to that. So I think for me, I have some of those negative anchors still. So I think the Wolf of Wall Street comes with both good and bad, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's a redemption story. And if you look at, and, and I also think that, that the way you look at anyone to model them, and that's what it's about really. Do you want to model someone? Do you want to learn from them? Do you want to adopt any of their characteristics? I think the important thing to remember is you never want to model the entire organism. You want to pull out the very best of what someone does. And those are the things you want to emulate and try to learn from, as well as also you can learn from people's mistakes and try to avoid certain behaviors. So when I go out there now and I deliver a message, it's really about that. It's about this, this, this best version of the wolf. So the wolf has got amazing qualities and the wolf also has some little carnivoristic tendencies need to be tamed. So, you know, I've learned thankfully in my older years to, to tame all those carnivoristic tendencies, and I have made this the very best version of the Wolf of Wall Street. Sales, selling, money, the desire to get rich, and the pursuit of all that. How's that changed from when you're in your 20s to now? Not much. I mean, the big di difference is that I, would, I don't equate success with just closing sales and making as much as I can. The question really is, is how's the other side working out. I won't engage in any behaviors. I won't sell anything. I won't convince someone to do something that doesn't actually have their life end up being improved as well. So it's not just about making money for me right now. It's more about how many people can I empower? How much can I help people? And by doing that, I make even more money. So it's, I believe the pursuit of wealth is an amazing thing. It's a noble thing. It's a great thing. I think it's uplifted more people out of poverty. I know it's lifted more people out of poverty than any other system out there, the capitalistic pursuit of wealth. 
that needs to be tempered with good intentions. Like any powerful weapon, persuasion is a weapon. It can be used for good or ill. Same way you have an M16, it could be the best weapon in the world if it's with a mom on the Ponderosa is holding her M16 and four men break out of jail and come in to rape her and her children and she blows them away. Bravo, good use of an M16. And then someone could climb a bell tower with an M16 and shoot innocent people. That's a pretty terrible use of an M16, right? So I think it's all about tension. When you can influence and persuade at a very high level, that's a powerful skill, a powerful weapon that can be used for good or ill. I make sure that I always use it for good and then try to instill that in everybody I teach the system to. Thank you, Jordan. We'll come back to some sales related questions a bit later on. Um, I've got a question here. I'm sorry if you've been asked this a thousand times. I'll try and make some original, but I still think we've got to ask this one. And a lot of people wanted me to ask you this. So the film, the 2013 film, The Wolf of Wall Street, um, how real was that film compared to your life? So it was very, I think what was very realistic and it was the, it captured the essence of that moment of my life, that, that, that period. It showed what happened in a way that really allowed people to almost felt like they were there and experiencing it. Most of it was true. Some scenes weren't, what was what mostly was incorrect with some of the order in which things happen. So they, in, in the movie business, they try to collapse on, remember they have three hours, that's a long movie, to tell a life story. So they are forced to collapse certain characters. So like for instance, Danny, the, the Jonah Hill character, he got the brunt of everything bad. Like, man, you know, they put five people's actions into one character, right? Well, good or ill. So, that, so that's an example. And then things like that, um, like, my, um, like the yacht sank, which was true, and the plane crashed, which was true, but it didn't happen in the same five minute period. It happened a week later. So, and, and like, I, you know, when I went to Switzerland, the, the timeline was compressed. So the big things though that weren't true, there was two real things, I was just, just three things that were, that were, that were inaccurate. Number one, um, and this is important, is that they made it seem like I went down to Wall Street as this naive babe in the woods. You know, can't we make our clients money too? That was like day one. I said to Matthew McConaughey, you know, can't we make our clients money? And he's like, no, we don't care about that, right? And that was showing that, that, that line of dialogue, which is accurate, that's what I said to this guy in day one, was in the movie to show that I was a good person. That was that's there to show that I started off with a moral compass. Can't we, I want to make our clients money. And then the next scene, as I'm still training, they have me in a strip club with five hookers snorting coke, right? That didn't happen. That, that, that the evolution of the human spirit took about two and a half to three years. So I was very, you know, through that whole period, I was a, a, as a trainee, I was in love with my wife, I wasn't cheating, I wasn't doing drugs. It took very, it was a very slow, insidious creep to where I was, become, I became that guy that was out there partying like a rock star, living like a king and doing all that, right? So that, so that sort of was interesting. I, I disagreed with, with that when, when I saw the script, I was like, I think that's, that's a mistake. I think it's more interesting to show a slower development, but... That's, you know, they decided that. So that was one thing. Another thing was the, there's a great scene in the movie when I say, I'm not leaving. The show goes on. And I basically, ref I'm going to leave Stratton and decide not to. Right? And then everything goes A-wire after that. That never happened. When I gave that speech, and that speech was almost dead on balls accurate, except I never said, I'm not leaving. Because I'm not stupid. I left. <laughs> I actually did leave. And I went, I had another company called Steve Madden Shoes, which was a very small company. I owned that company too. And I went and ran that company with Steve. And we shared an office together for years. So I spent the next section at Steve Madden. Now, in that case, I understood why they made the change. And I thought it was a good change for the, for the purposes of an entertaining movie that I stayed in because it kept the action in the place that everybody loved, which was the boardroom. So that I got, I, I didn't think that was an error, okay? Um, another thing that was fictitious, although I wish it had happened, because it was a wonderful scene, 
was the meeting on the yacht with the FBI agent. That never happened. Um, but it was a great scene. And I, and I love, I think they, and we actually s- discussed that, that we thought, and it was more so I agree that we should definitely have us meeting in the middle somewhere would be a great way to increase the tension. So that was, that was just purely invented. But I did know about Coleman and we were like arch enemies from this distance. We're now very good friends, actually. He's been on my own podcast. It's pretty ironic, right? So we became friends over time. Um, so that scene was invented. And then there's one more thing that I think is important for everyone who's listening, and this is really important for your own careers, is that there's a scene very subtly in the, um, in the early part of the movie when I go to work at that small firm and I'm being interviewed, and I ask the guy, I said, well, hey, is this stuff legal? And he says, well, you know, you know, right? Let me just tell you something. If he would have said that to me, I would have run out the door. I had never gotten in trouble in my life. I wasn't about to go work somewhere that it was maybe not legal. What he did say was, of course it's legal. We're members of the NASD and regulated by the SEC. So the, the, the lesson there, this is important to everyone who's listening, you know, when you go out into the workplace and you go into a company, if things don't seem right, don't just assume, well, yeah, how can we be in business? No, you got to go with your gut. I, that was a big mistake I made. They didn't really, they misled you in the movie that I was just like, oh, yeah, sure. I don't care. That never happened. Were you quite involved in the film in terms of, you know, the, the writing of it? And yeah. yeah. Intimately. I spent a year with Leo, very, very close, spent a lot of time together. Uh, and I worked very close with Terry Winter, the screenwriter, who's a brilliant screenwriter. Um, and I, I mean, I went through every single word of the script with, you know, Terry adapted my book and did an amazing job. Uh, and then I went through the script and rewrote a lot of the boardroom scenes and lingo. And I did all the, all the, uh, the stuff that you saw with like the presentations, the speeches that Leo gives are all like literally word for word out of the book. So the, the screenwriter, Terry was, you know, literally ego list there and just literally transplanted what I had written in the book into the movie. That's why he's such a great writer, Terry. He doesn't try to like change it to put his own stamp on it. And also I rewrote all the, the sales scenes like where there's the back and forth. Um, so I was really involved. Hi, it's Rob. Quick interruption here to make sure you like this video and you subscribe to the channel. We are upping our content game, bringing you the most disruptive interviewees and guests and content and not just the people who do the usual circuit. So make sure you like, subscribe, and now let's get back to the interview. So. Um, there's a bit of debate going on online um, and some people say that everybody should be given another chance and other people would say, well, a criminal is a criminal and, you know, once a criminal, always a criminal. Um, I don't judge. I'd like to ask the person face to face and here I am with you. So um, should everyone be given a second chance, bearing in mind you've essentially got a second chance uh, and can people change? Yeah, so I would say that the people who are probably saying that no one deserves a second chance are probably watching um, Pornhub all day long and are breaking the laws themselves every single day. And they're scum-sucking pigs, so go fuck yourselves, all right? Because honestly, if that's the way you move through life, forget about me for a second. Mom, I'm already way past caring. But there are so many people that out that make mistakes, including you and your family, that if you're that narrow-minded and you're that judgmental, you don't belong on planet Earth. You really, really don't. I feel sorry for you. I really, really do. Because to be that judgmental and that narrow-minded really speaks to your character more than anybody else's. Amen. (laughs) Uh, Right, next then. Um, Did you lose everything or did you manage to hold on to some stuff, hide some stuff, keep some stuff? Um, not, I didn't hide anything because that the the, the, the the danger of hiding something. Oh my god! Like if you if you got caught hiding something, that would have been like you know, it's just not worth it. You know, it's really not. You know, because because I could have gotten twenty more years, right? So no, but I did. They did. They did not wipe me out. They left me with about a yeah, million and a, a million dollars or so. And guess what? That million dollars went back <laughs> because, of, you know, my spending habits were so massive that uh, that million. So I, I had to start over again. So everything I have and have rebuilt is, is all new money. Right. And, and that was 99, was it? 19 what? Was it 1999 around that time? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. 
And how long did it take you when you looked in the mirror and went, I'm back in the game, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good here, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well again? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, it's different because there's, there's money and then there's fame and celebrity, right? So when it, in terms of like, I wrote, when I started writing this book, I, so I, I never, ever doubted in my life that I would make a lot of money again. That was never even an issue for me. I always knew that I could go out back and make a fortune, never doubted that, not even for a split second. When you can really sell at the level I can sell and you can persuade and you understand the business skills and you have the mindset I have, and that goes for anybody here, and that's what I teach for you, can always come back from adversity. That's a, that's a guarantee. Uh, I never thought, though, that I would come back in the way I did by writing a book that would become, you know, like that I never thought. So um, that, that journey happened by accident. I, you know, I started writing, and then the, the, the people loved the early writing so much um, that I decided to, like, take a year off of like just even trying to do anything, but I just wrote for a year. So I thought, so that's about three months of writing. Um, I sold the book, but it was still being written to Random House. And I got about half a million dollars. That was nothing for me, but at least that gave me something, you know, to live on. I had no money at the time. And that was 2005. And then when the book was completed, Literally, like before it was in bookstores, the manuscript got passed around Hollywood and then a bidding war started with, um, between back Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio. And there was this crazy weekend where both sides were bidding on the project. It was going up and up. And when it closed, I remember getting this call. Like I was at my, my, my uh, club that I am a member of, a tennis club. And I remember my agent called me. He goes, you're not going to believe this. There's a bidding war going on right now between Leo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. And then that night later that I got a call from Leo Marty Scorsese is involved. The next, and they, my age goes, this is gonna be all over the news tomorrow morning. That was, I said, holy shit. And there it goes, I said, and there it goes again. And it's like, and anyone who knew me wouldn't, wasn't surprised. Cause like that, you know, I don't think anyone doubted I would come back from what happened, but I don't think anyone really would come back like that in this way. Um, but that was when I kind of said, holy Christ, I mean, my life is just something to be bold. I mean, like, you know, I, you know, I write a book. What are the chances of like, you know, I didn't know how to write. I mean, what were the chances of that happening? It's just slim and nil and, you know, slim left town a long time ago. So it was pretty shocking even to me with all my abilities I had. I knew I had. I knew I possessed these abilities to make money. That was a shocker, I have to say. On that note then of success, because you said it could be defined differently. Would you say your biggest success in that period was making the money again? Was it writing the book and selling the book, selling the film rights? Was it just the fact that you phoenixed yourself from the ashes? Was it that you'd become a more complete person? How did you define success? You know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a loaded question. There's so many different ways that you can look at that and different aspects of my life. You know, there's so much that gets integrated into forming me and how I feel. So on, on one regard, my greatest success was being able to fulfill my why, you know, why I, I wanted to come back in the first place, why I wanted to, um, you know, become wealthy and respected again, make up for what had happened. Um, and what, were, what gave me the emotional wherewithal while I was in jail to write that book. Like, you know, most people are just so negative and it's, you know, what was I doing? How was I able to, to ward off those negative thoughts and continue on this path? And the, and the answer was, it was the love of my children. It was my, my two kids and the idea that I let them down and they had to watch their dad go to jail. And in my mind, I was like, I am not gonna stop until I've redeemed myself in the eyes of my children. I want to prove to them that dad can do it right, can come back. So on that regard, my greatest success was that like my kids look at me today as if like they can't even believe their own dad. Like, you know, that's my dad, you know, like, you know, you know, they, they watched the whole thing happen. They, you know, they, when they were in college, kids were singing my song, the Jordan Belfort song. So like they had to go. So it's like this. It was for them. To, in my heart, that's probably the greatest success was to um to be able to be a force of 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 in my children's lives of such positivity and instill the values that they have today. That's the big one. 
on the financial side, obviously, just you know, coming back and 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 being able to build a large business again. But mostly about all the people. I mean, I have so many people around the world whose lives I've impacted and empowered. I mean, it's like a nonstop onslaught I get of people writing me these amazing emails and just you know about changed their lives. It goes every day. It just goes on and on. It gets bigger and bigger because the straight line system is life changing for people. It really, really is. And what I did was took something that I misused in my youth and I flipped it into a different way. So it took that power and redirected the energy in, a, in, the, in the exact opposite direction. And now it turned into this amazing thing that people use all over the world to lift themselves up out of poverty, add zeros onto their income, create jobs for other people, feed their families. It's a great, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Did you get the chance to or try to in any way pay back any of the people that lost any of the money? Was that something that you were able to do, whether it was for your own catharsis or because you felt it was right or, or all the people that invested the money back then, did they just lose it all? No, so, so what happened was there, there was, um, originally there was a lot of money that was given back. It wasn't just me, so there was multiple people. Um, I think four, five people were all in the same fund that everyone was contributing to the same pool of investors that lost money. So it wasn't just like I was paying back. It was four, four others besides me that were contributing money. So I can't say that I can't say I take responsibility for every dollar that was hit back. There's others that pay back too. I certainly have paid back a lot more than anybody else. I probably paid back more myself than everyone else combined, but there were others in there as well that were responsible. And some of them did not pay back. Like they actually, you know, did not try. I act, actually did. Um, very early on, though, they ran out of investors to pay. So in, in, in 2005, um, I received a report that they had $500,000 left in the fund and they couldn't find anyone to send it to. <laughs> so they kept it. The government kept that money. Since then, I paid back probably another 10 million more that no one is getting. So there's no more investors going after the fund. Now, that is interesting because there are some people that said they, it was a, like two or three things. I still haven't gotten paid back. I don't know. I kept, I kept paying money into this fund and no one was getting the money. So that's the story. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, what makes a great salesperson? Um, well, there's, you know, a combination. There's, you know, certain personality traits, certain core competencies um, that people possess at, that make them natural born closers. And then there's the ability to learn those things as well. So what the straight line system does, it actually identifies, you know, what all those core competencies are and strategies and helps people who are not naturally good at selling, allows them to close in the same way and at the same level of success as a natural born closer. So there's two, there's, there's people who are born with those abilities and there are most people, it's very rare, it's like 2% and there's 98% who are not born with those abilities. The good news is, is that you can learn those same abilities by learning the straight line, by studying the straight line. Now, I always say that, you know, I'm not saying I could take someone who's like the worst natural salesperson in the world and make them into me. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that I can make you into the best version of yourself. So in other words, so many people are so disempowered by their inability to communicate a message, whether it's in sales, negotiations, no matter what it is, they just can't communicate effectively, right? I could take any human being using the straight line and make them proficient enough so they can live their life at the highest level. And it won't be that that held them back from that. It may be other things, but not, it won't be their inability to sell or communicate that stops them from achieving success. Okay. So what are some of those traits, those skills that makes a really good salesperson? Well, one obviously is, you know, you know, you know what's your ability to use tonality? There's certain tonalities that, we use again and again and again when we're communicating in a sales situation. And what happens is, is that, you know, when we communicate, we all think, all right, well, you know, we're saying words and, you know, the words are going to make this 
logical case and also this emotional case. And, and we use our words to communicate and make points and sell. But, you know, words are actually only a small percentage of overall human communication. They make up about 10% of human communication. And then the rest of it, you know, the 90% approximately is tonality and body language. So what you often find is that people, the way their internal communications platform is wired is, yeah, they might be able to say the words. And when they're saying those words, they think that they're applying the right tonality. Like they think they sound enthusiastic. They think they sound certain, but they don't. They have, they're almost like tone deaf to their own communication. So it's essentially they're trying to sell. Like I, I, just yesterday, I had a guy on, on a, on a Q&A I was doing. He's like, you know, how do I, you know, how do I make myself sound more enthusiastic? And I'm like, I said, guy, I can tell you right now that you're one of those people. You you are cursed with that. You you you're level. You think you sound enthusiastic? It's like a wet blanket. Like you 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 think you sound enthusiastic? You don't. You actually have a problem with that. The good news is, once you realize you have a problem, you can fix that problem. So many people go through life. They think they sound enthusiastic. They think they sound certain. They think they sound sincere. They think they, they found like reasonable. But the words, when someone else listening to like, you don't sound that way. So with the straight line system, we're able to fix that and actually make sure that someone that, when they, when they want to sound certain, they actually do sound certain. When they want to sound sincere, like when they're really feeling sincere, they sound sincere. Like I had people like, you know, like, like they think they, they're being sincere and they sound as sneaky as shit, right? It's like they, they don't know. They're tone deaf to their own communication, right? So it's very easy to fix. So that's, that's, that's one example. And body language, of course, as well. Um, you know, how you dress, how you move your body, not just when you're talking, but also when you're listening. So there's all these different things. Okay, thank you. Um, who's the best salesperson you've ever seen in the world? Me. Who's the second best person in sales you've ever seen in the world? Hmm, the second best salesperson I've ever seen in the world. Got to think about that one, can't answer you. All right, we, we maybe come back. Why are you the best? Oh, man, I, you know, I, I, I've never come across someone that had the level of natural ability that I had that actually took the time to develop it the way I have. I'm a big believer that to really be the best at something, you got to be able to teach it to someone else. Teaching is a huge part of learning. So I've taught so many people how to do what I'm able to do. And by teaching, I get better at what I do. So I've, I've taken what is a natural born skill with that, that they imagine is there's a a million people who are natural born closers. And of those million, there's maybe 0.01% that are the very, very top natural born closers. I'm in that top 0.01%. I just am. I know I am. And then I've actually spent my entire life owning that skill by teaching it to others and practicing it myself. So that's why I'm the best. Okay. Um, how good is Grant Cardone at selling? I mean, from what I saw, he's awful. He sucks. But, you know, again, I, I think there's two Grand Cardones. I think there's the Grand Cardone of today. And maybe there was a different Grand Cardone many years ago before he lost his mind. I mean, I think the guy, something happened to him where I think he's no longer maybe what he once was. That's giving him the benefit of the doubt. Of the doubt. Maybe he never was. Anything was all a big lie. Um, and that's common where people, you know, they use the internet to create a certain image and and he you was know, just a passively okay salesperson. Uh, what I saw, the guy is just awful, knows nothing about persuasion. And, and, but maybe there was once a different Grant Cardone. I don't know. So when you say, you know, when he lost his mind, what, what do you think he lost? I refer anyone to the podcast I did with Grant Cardone, and you can understand what I'm talking about. I, I will. I'll make sure. I mean, a lot of people I know have already watched that. Yeah, they know, they all know what I'm talking about. I'll make sure. I'll make sure everyone does. What, what went on there? What was that all about? Yeah, you know, I, just, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think it was very obvious to everyone who watched that I had good intentions, no agenda, just, was, you know, inviting someone on my podcast um, to try to have a really honest conversation about selling, about, you know, the different philosophies. Because 
I, I believe that it could be many different paths to the same outcome. Um, but as we all know, a straight line is the shortest distance to any outcome. So I know the straight line works better, but I'm, I love to um, hear from someone else and hopefully learn from someone else. And I thought my people that were listening, which is a sales centric audience and entrepreneur centric audience would have something to, to gain by this. And then, um, so I just was really a nothing but the, the, the best of intentions. And he came on the show with like, just, I don't know what, this like defensiveness and insecurity. And um, he seemed like he was high, although I don't know if he was or not. He seemed like he was agitated. Something was really, really bizarre about the guy. Like, you know, the guys, I mean, I mean to this day, there's memes go on and on about Grant. Like, I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't post one thing without someone saying, no oxygen is oxygen, you know, got some, I mean, he created all these crazy memes because he just was saying stupidity on, it was like stupidity on top of stupidity. And it was like, I was like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? It was like really obvious that he knew nothing about selling in the real world. Like it just didn't make any sense what he was saying. Like it was nonsensical and everyone knew it. And I think he started to know it. And then he got all angry and, goes, and he challenged me to a cage match. He was like 62 years old. And I just had my shoulder up. I was like, Grant, then, yeah, let's go to a cage. He just made a fool of himself, you know? So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think he, um, he, um, regrets that he ever did that um but when he tried to defend himself after it almost made it worse because he was like because I mean, as much as the podcast there was all these people making podcasts about the podcast and they were just ripping him to shreds like just to shreds you know and then he tried to defend it and they ripped his defense to shreds so yeah, i just think sometimes you got to just say fuck it I, I, it was you know let's just close that chapter i think that's what he should do or should have done Ooh. was it was it awkward for you sat in there with it? Because I guess if you say you had good intentions and then it went like it went, you know, I haven't been in an interview yet myself. I've done hundreds of interviews, Jordan, and thankfully I haven't sat in one where it's been really awkward and I've just wanted to get the hell out of there and that scares me a bit. Was it a bit like that or did you enjoy it? It was, no, it was, it was more awkward because you know what it was? Like, I really, honestly, I really, I kind of felt bad for the guy. I tried to save him. I really did. I, it was at one point when he did something so stupid that I tried to stop him. Because I felt, I really, because I didn't dislike, I didn't know the guy. I did not know the guy, all right? So I had no ill will towards him. And he said something really, really problematic for him. He said like, oh, I charge one person $100 and I charge a corporation $50,000 for the same product. I was like, well, I was like, well, not for the same. I was trying to, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, that's like, really? Well, if I'm the corporation, I'm going to be pretty fucking pissed, right? I just said someone overcharge. I'm like, well, you don't mean the same product. No, no, the same exact. And he just kept going like he, like, he lost his collective nut, basically, right? So, you know, it got a bit uncomfortable there. And then also I found it difficult to keep a thread of the conversation like he what it was like he was saying stupidity like it's like i'm like i couldn't like what is he fucking talking about the guy and it was like and then people started making fun of it like no sense is sense and it, you know, the answers were so stupid that i was like well where do you go from there the guy's just like talking stupidity so it was a bit uncomfortable like that that i had to struggle to to keep it moving forward there were many times i'm like all right well if you don't want to talk about sales let's talk about real estate like it almost got to the point where i couldn't even like pull the thread of a conversation with the guy like listen obviously you don't know about this so let's talk about something else so i wouldn't say it wasn't it was like uncomfortable more than anything thank you i appreciate getting your side of that so um we have a couple of different rounds now so we're going to change the flow of the interview a bit jordan if that's okay so we've started introducing a new round called the cheeky round where we just ask some bit more brave questions and then we have a quick fire round. Um, so we've got four in the cheeky round and one of them is what's the most amount of money you've ever spent in a day? Hmm. No, so I would say I lost, including gambling, probably two or three million in one night with between gambling losses and drugs and jewellery expenditures and private jets. Wow. Okay. What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Scuba dived on quaaludes at 80 feet. <laughs> okay. Someone told me you've got a net worth of minus 100 million. Um, can you put that right? Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, people can believe what they want. So 
Um, I think what they're talking about is that there's an old uh, judgment that's now down to much lower, but it doesn't really work that way. And it expires in a couple of years. So um, I wouldn't quite say that. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, it depends. If you believe, let's just say if you believe that, all right, then I got a bridge to sell you. Okay. <laughs> um, when was the last time you took drugs? April 19th, 1997. Well done on staying off them for this long. Do, do, do you ever get tempted to slide back to that world of whatever that world was? No. I still drink. I mean, you know, I'm just not a big drinker. I just don't drink much. Yeah, you know, I hardly drink, but I drink. Yeah. I don't consider smoking pot. Pot's, pot's legal now. So, I mean, I've, I've tried marijuana a few times. I just don't like it, you know, but. Uh, right. Quick fire then. Um, What's your biggest single regret? Then I, then I took the straight line system early on and didn't, didn't um, use it the right way because I'd be worth 50 billion right now, probably. I would have had to start over. I didn't have to start over. I would have just been had this you know, straight ride. But you know, no regrets really because um, my life is amazing now and all that led up to this point and I probably wouldn't be able to you know, be helping so many people around the world. I would have just been probably retire with a very small group of people, you know? Yeah. What's the best advice you can remember ever receiving? My mother once said to me, well, she said, she said to me 1,000 times the same thing, but you lay down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. What's the worst advice you can ever remember receiving? If you want to succeed in life, I want you to leap off the cliff and grow wings on the way down. Why is that bad advice? Stupidest of all, because you're going to smash into the earth. And when you're down there, you're going to develop limiting beliefs and people will be pissing on you. And it's very difficult to come back. You don't want to leap and grow wings. You want to do is grow some nubby wings first, some little small ones, and then leap and flap like crazy. And as you're sinking, the wings are starting to grow more. And then you start sailing up. You don't want to leap without looking. You want to learn some stuff. You want to know the basics, fundamentals of what you're doing. Just don't leap and try to figure it out on the way down. You probably won't. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there one thing that you think is really wrong with the world that you would like to change? Yes, the, um, the um, liberals. A any reason why? Yeah, because the liberals, the liberals when I was growing up were these incredibly amazing people that were fighting for true social justice, not the insane shit you hear about today. Um, and they would have these conversations, spirited conversations with people who were conservatives. And it was amazing. Now the liberals are just fucking crazy. They just throw labels. Anyone who doesn't agree with them is that you're this, you're that, you, you're, you hate. It's like, it's all about labels and name calling and emotions. There's no more logical arguments left to the liberals. It's really sad. And I'm not talking about normal liberals. I'm talking about this, 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 this stuff action of very vocal liberals right now who have hijacked the narrative in this country at least and in many countries around the world and it's created dynamic now where it's just like it's just completely there is no more sense or reason or compromise between the two parties when i was growing up the democrats and republicans were basically two sides of the same coin those days are gone and now we're paying the price for that mm. okay um there's a question that does the round on podcasts, which I don't ask, but I actually think if it was made for anyone, it's made for you. So I'm going to ask it. Well, and that is what advice would you give your 20 year old self? Delay my gratification. Don't try to make it tomorrow. Tomorrow, like I was so intent on making it quick and good things take time. So I think a lot of the early problems I had in my career were based on this inability to delay my desire for instant gratification. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's such a cliche already to disrupt. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, it's, it's almost lost its power and meaning, you know. I mean, true disruption is really about, you know, going into a market and you know going into finding a much better way of doing things and as a result of that basically putting most of the people that are currently delivering that good of service out of business or forcing to adapt and change to your way of doing things so it's it's about coming up with a better mousetrap so to speak sure 
Okay, thank you. Um, what did you learn in prison? And a right. <laughs> that, that kept you um, occupied, did it? Kept your mind focused? One second. Hold on a second. I got to call Zodoya, all right? Just one second. Right. Hold on. Yeah. Hey, uh just absolutely panned the title of my podcast. <laughs> yeah, um, in addition to writing, what did you learn in prison? The reality of consequences. In other words, that, you know, there's, I mean, it's not that I didn't know that beforehand, but I, I think that, you know, when you go to prison and you, you, and you, you have to take this time out, so to speak, um, you um, learn that, you know, you need to be really, really careful with the things that you do because, you know, the future does come. The, the consequences to your actions will eventually come. And um, in what you, you know, you reap what you sow, basically. And that's um, highlighted when you're in prison with a lot of time to think. Mm. Okay. So um, finally, then, obviously, you have your straight line system. Why don't you tell us a bit about that and then where we can find you and follow you. And if we want to look at your straight line system or anything else that you offer. Yeah, so I, I, I um, so I, I've been teaching the straight line for many, many years, and um, there's many different versions of it. There's beginners versions, there's intermediate, and the advanced. And the last one, the advanced one, what I created um, is so. I mean, it's such a leap forward in my ability to help people anywhere in the world whether they're in a large corporation or individuals achieve massive success in sales in a very short period of time. So, so certainly that system. So what I, what I typically do on some of these podcasts where I, I you know, to, to, to uh, the right group of people will actually give everyone a free training, a free demo into the system. So I'm going to do that for you guys here. I think there's a link. I got to find out what that link is. Um, but I'm going to give you guys a link here. Do, do you have the link? You know what it is or no? No, I've not been given it, but do you want me to um, WhatsApp my guy and see if he's got it? Um, yes, there's a li link to home, the link to the training. Okay. Um, yeah, and basically what it is, it's, it's a, the demo module. It gives you a really good background and some real-world skills for the straight line, and it's awesome. So everyone gets that for free. And just so you know, when I say for free, I don't mean that you have to, like, give me your credit card, and then in seven days, if you don't cancel, you get billed. I'm not, I don't mean, not, not that, I mean, really free. <laughs> like, you don't have to give me your credit card. Just, like, tell them what you want. All you're doing is give me your email, and I'll send you a link to the training, and that's it. And if you like it, which I know you will, and you decide you want to purchase it, you can get some special discount, but you don't have to. That's up to you. But either way, you'll be a lot better off because the, the, the demo, you're getting the demo in the first lesson of module in one of this training, and it's, it's literally life-changing. So... I give that away, and it's going to be at, it'll be at jordanbelfort.com slash something or other. I'm not sure what that slash is, okay? So, um, Jordan, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, we'll put it uh, uh, in the YouTube video as well. I've asked my guy if he knows to get it, so we'll get that. Um, can we follow you on social media and then get it from there? Yeah, so, you know, you could, you know, I have verified accounts of Facebook, Instagram, all over the place, uh, my, my podcast. Um, so, yeah, I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. You can't move without seeing me. No, but I think, listen, I, I really believe, honestly, that, that in this moment in time, it was just, I mean, this has been an unprecedented economic upheaval, really. I mean, it's been, a, it's been a forced shutdown. Like I've never seen, I've been around a lot longer than you. I really hold it, right? I, I've been through a lot of good economies and really bad ones too. All right? I lived through the 87 crash where they thought the world was going to complete shit, all right? I've never seen something like this. I never have. I don't know exactly, I, I would be lying to everyone if I said I know exactly what's gonna happen next. What I do know, and this is an absolute certainty, is that there are going to be huge winners that emerge from this economy and from this, from this upheaval, and there's going to be some huge losers. And those people that are the winners are those that are going to take action, that they possess the skills. Well, here's the, it's the link is jordanbelfort.com slash bonus. All right? jordanbelfort.com slash bonus. So I think the people that are going to win are going to be those that take action, that possess the skills. And persuasion closing 
is the single most important skill bar none. So you have to learn this. This is a required course. When you choose to take it is up to you, but you've got to learn this stuff. If you want to really succeed, this can be a very competitive time now. Massive unemployment, industries that are vanishing and new ones forming. The question is, is where are you going to be in that equation? You know, I want you to be on the right side, bottom line. How's business been for you and how have things changed since, you know, the virus, the lockdown? Business has been great on some respects and terrible in others. So obviously my live events business is done, right? That's over for now. And, and um, I don't expect that to come back anytime soon where I sit in a stadium with 5,000 people, right? So take a little more time. Eventually, I think it comes back for sure. Um, but my online business, of course, my online education, that is doing phenomenally well. I'm just now in the recruiting space as well. All other business I'm doing, we actually recruit salespeople for companies and train them, deliver, train salespeople. So it's a lot we're doing, but I think the key is to right now is remember there's going to be this paradigm shift that occurred from this. Things are not going to go back to the old way. There's going to be new industries that are really sprouting up to service the changes in the collective psychology of the world right now. And there'll be some industries that are going to die on the vine. Make sure you're in the right side of that equation. But Jordan, I want to say thank you very much for giving your time up. I know you're a busy man. Really grateful. I've had a lot of fun. Um, thank you for being you. And thanks a lot for doing the podcast. Good luck, buddy. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.